Assalamu alaikum. Good day. All the prayers and greetings. These lectures are little ahead recorded. So maybe when you listen to them, things would have changed for better. And I really pray and look forward again to the days when we could live a life which, where we would have learnt lessons and the caution should have come as a habit to us. Today we will talk about the First World War, the American um, role in it, an American share in it rather. And then uh, when we talk about in next lecture, it would be the Depression. Woodrow Wilson was, became a president in 1912 and he was a well-intentioned and idealistic man and he wanted to help other countries, especially the republics of Latin America. At the same time, he felt obliged to sustain and protect American interests abroad and the maintenance of the open door policy to China and the completion of the Panama Canal were as important to him as they had been to Theodore Roosevelt. His attitude resembled that of 19th century Christian missionaries. He wanted to spread the gospel of American, mission, uh, American democracy to lift and enlighten the unfortunate and the ignorant but all of it he could do in his own way. It is called that uh, Wilson's uh, diplomacy was a moral diplomacy. And he set out to raise the moral tone of American foreign policy by denouncing dollar diplomacy. Isn't it we facing the same question in a very reverse way? Uh, encouraging bankers to lend money to countries like China, he said, implied the possibility of forcible interference if the loans were not repaid and that would be obnoxious to the principles upon which the government of our people rest, he said. In certain small matters, Wilson succeeded in conducting American diplomacy on this idealistic basis. But where more interest and a very vital interest of the United States were concerned, Wilson sometimes failed to live up to the promises. Because of the strategic importance of the Panama Canal, he was unable to tolerate unrest anywhere in the Caribbean. Soon after his inauguration, he was pursuing the same ways. The most serious example of this moral diplomacy occurred in Mexico. In 1911, a liberal coalition overthrew the dictator Porfirino, excuse me, Porfirio uh, Diaz, who had been exploiting the resources and people of Mexico for the benefit of a small class of wealthy landowners. I think this is still story, a very real story in many countries. The Woodrow Wilson thought that uh, <clears throat> he cannot, in his own words, he cannot recognize a government of butchers. This was unconventional because nations do not ordinarily consider the means by which a foreign regime has come to power before deciding <clears throat> that they should be helped or not. Wilson brought enormous pressure to bear against this kind of dealings. He uh, dragooned the British into withdrawn recognition. So, in his, this, basically it was a con contest of wills and Wilson subordinated his wish to let the Mexicans solve their own problems to 
his desire to destroy Huerta. Wilson finally realized the extent that uh, he cannot change the mode of uh, governance, the attitude and diplomacy of every country. So missionary diplomacy in Mexico had produced mixed but in the wrong, long run beneficial results. The um, Wilson theory or Wilson principles were gaining support. While this was happening, Europe exploded in a great war, World War I, on um, June 28, 1914. This outbreak of the Great War caught American psychologically unprepared. Few understood the significance of what had happened. President Wilson promptly issued a proclamation of neutrality and the almost unanimous reaction of Americans aside from dismay was the conflict did not concern them. They were wrong. For this was a world war and Americans were sure to be affected by its outcome. Though most of the Americans hoped to keep out of the war, nearly everyone was partial to one side or the other. And they had to, they had to, because uh, a war was not only within a small uh, area or within minimized uh, countries, the war was taking over as a world war. In February 1915, when Germany declared the water surrounding the British Isles a zone of war and announced that they would sink without warning, all enemy merchant ships encountered in the area. So the freedom at the seas was coming under attack. It would have been difficult politically for German government to have backed down before an American ultimatum. However, after dragging the uh, controversy out for nearly a year, it did apologize and agreed to pray an indemnity. Finally, after the torpedoing of the French Channel steamer Sussex in March 1916, had produced another stiff American protest, the German at last promised one Sussex pledge. It is called to stop sinking merchant ships without warning. So at least moral diplomacy worked somewhere. Then came the elections of 1916, where the content, uh, content, I'm sorry, contestants were Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson himself. The convention um, of uh, all these uh, parties, demonstrations were that lasted more than 20 minutes and thus he kept us. The democratic slogan became, he kept us out of war and Roosevelt has joined the Republican side. The combination of progressism and the peace issue placed the Democrats on substantially equal terms with the Republicans. And when Roosevelt uh, triumphed to become a president and won over the elections, and he was, was also mindful that the United States would be dragged into the Holocaust. Wilson's own feelings were more genuinely neutral than at any other time during the war, for the Germans had stopped sinking merchants' ships without warning, and the British had initiated him repeatedly by their arbitrary restrictions on neutral trade. The noble appeal met a very tragic end. The Germans had already decided to renounce the Sussex Pledge and unleash their submarines against all vessels headed for Allies' port. 
So, this was going back to their own agreement. The president's Presbyterian conscience tortured him relentlessly. He lost sleep, appeared grey and drawn. When someone asked him which side he hoped would win, he answered petulantly, neither. So, in the end, he could satisfy himself only by giving intervention on idealistic purposes. Out of this long bloodbath of World War I, there came a new and better world. But it didn't. But it didn't. The war must be fought to end for all times, war itself. Thus in the name, not of vengeance and victory, but of justice and humanity, he sent his people into battle. America's in entry into the World War has uh, one very important outcome. So, the Allies were rapidly running out of money and supplies. Their um, armies were disheartened and rebellious. And it was a close thing for the United States that entered the war a little later, better prepared to fight than it had been in 1898. So, the conversion of American industry to war production, which it continues till date, had to be organized and uh, carried out without much planning. Confusion and waste resulted. Airplanes, tanks and artillery construction, programs all too large to begin with, developed too slowly to affect the war. American soldiers were mostly transported in British ships and their ammunition was made in France. So, America was unprepared for, to enter this great war. The problem of mobilization was also complicated because it took Congress six weeks of hot debate merely to decide on conscription. Wilson was a forceful and inspiring war leader when he grabs what needed to be done. Waste there was an inefficiency, but no one in the country worked harder or displayed such patience in the face of frustration and criticism. Evaluating the Mobilizing efforts raise interesting historical uh, questions. Mobilization required close cooperation between business and the military. However, the army resisted cooperating with civilian agencies. Wilson finally compelled the War Department to place officers on uh, these committees. When the army discovered that its interests were not injured by the system, the foundation for what was later known as industrial military complex were laid, the alliance between business and military leaders that was to cause so much controversy after World War II. It was a time of um, restraint. Their short of supplies made it almost impossible to avoid rationing and farmers of course, they were, they profited. Their real income went up nearly 30 percent between 1915 and 1918. The workers in war time, the movement of Af African American from the former slave states began with the emancipation. But the mass exodus that many people had expected did not materialize. And paying for the war, Wilson managed to task of financing the war effectively. But this struggle cost the United States about 33.5 billion not coming from anywhere else and not counting pensions and other post-war expenses. In addition to borrowing, the government collected about 10.5 billion in taxes during the war. So, thus, although many individuals made fortunes out of this war, 
its cost was distributed far more equitably than was that of the civil war. And wartime reforms saw again women and African Americans in wartime. These, um, the wartime great migration of southern blacks to northern cities where jobs were available brought these women to important economic benefits. There were two um, things to understand about this that many blacks condemned uh, the uh, that Dubois who was uh, a black but uh, supported the wall wholeheartedly but every Afro-American was not with them. And long before the war ended in a speech in, to Congress in January 8, 1918, Wilson outlined a plan known as the 14 points designed to make the world fit and safe to live in. This was a peace treaty. 